I'm going to be sharing information today that I've never talked about before. In fact, I, I spent some time this morning adding new slides to this PowerPoint from various sources because the, the field of genetic engineering is evolving very quickly. But unfortunately, our ethics and morals and, and long-term vision and understanding of the DNA and consequences is not evolving at the same time. Before we start, I want to get a, a sense of you and what your habits are. So I'm going to ask you to rate yourself in terms of from 0% to 100%. What percentage of your diet is organic? And I'm going to make it hard and say that includes going out to eat, going to movies, eating at other people's houses, everything, going on vacation. Give yourself one number right now from zero to 100, and I'm gonna ask you to raise your hand if you're in the following categories. How many people are zero to 20%? Raise your hand. Okay, I'm looking around, I see several people. 20 to 40% organic, raise your hand about the same amount, 40 to 60%, about the same amount, 60 to 80%, similar, 80 to 100%, and a little bit less. Okay, this is pretest. We're gonna see what your numbers are gonna be like in the future. And now I wanna ask you, I'd like you to rate GMOs in comparison to climate change in terms of a planetary threat. Three questions, are GMOs less dangerous? about the same or more. Okay, how many people say less dangerous? Raise your hand. About the same? Raise your hand. More dangerous? Raise your hand. Well, more dangerous clearly has it. <coughs> Maybe five, <coughs> five to one. Um, and that's, I found that interesting. I asked that question for the first time in September, and I wasn't expecting it. But this is the eighth audience I've asked. And in all eight audiences, it was equal to or greater was, was the GMOs versus climate change. Now I'm gonna tell you why I think that's the case. And I'm gonna do it by showing you, I'm gonna start this lecture by leaving the stage and show you instead a three minute video, which is at the, at the website protectnaturenow.com. And after watching it, it gives a sense of one of the new areas that we're focusing on that's absolutely critical, an existential threat like no other. So you're going to enjoy watching this three-minute minute video, and I'll come back on. If we stop climate change, save our oceans, and protect our soils, we may still lose the natural world we cherish. A quiet invasion is underway where companies who profit from altering DNA are declaring open season on all parts of nature. Like the gold rush of the Wild West, there is a global gene rush underway, moving from engineering crops to engineering entire ecosystems. From algae to animals, fungus to flowers, bacteria to bees. With genetic engineering techniques such as gene editing costing less than ever, Nothing is off limits. Once released, GMOs reproduce. Artificial changes can spread through the environment and corrupt the gene pool. We have no strategies to clean it up. The only thing lasting longer than a permanently altered gene pool is extinction. Last century, the assault of synthetic chemicals polluted nature. Today's genetic assault could replace nature forever. What is the most common outcome of genetic engineering? Surprise side effects. It's not that individuals seek to permanently replace nature with unpredictable laboratory creations. It's thousands upon thousands of labs racing to get their invented organisms out there first. And many governments, including the US, Australia, Argentina, Brazil, and Japan, are eliminating regulations and safety precautions, hoping that GMO companies can make quick profits and dominate. On June 6th, 
the Trump administration proposed new rules that would make almost every GMO exempt from regulations by the Department of Agriculture. On June 11th, President Trump signed an executive order to further erode government oversight. In addition, it authorizes the U.S. State Department, trade representatives, and other agencies to work together to convince the world to accept GMOs and by October 9th, have a strategy in place to use the maximum financial, political, and diplomatic pressure to arm twist the nations of the world into fully accepting America's GMOs. Do you think the citizens of the world will have something to say about that? We do. In fact, we invite you to join a global protest to say it loud and clear. It's time to blow the whistle not just for our children and grandchildren, but for all living beings and all future generations. They're depending on us. Protect nature now. Well, there you have it. Now, I'm not going to leave you with no hope and no plan. That's not my job. For years, for a quarter of a century, I've been focusing on another aspect of GMOs, the health dangers, and the strategy was to redirect people's purchasing power so that it would influence the food industry, so that the food industry would kick GMOs out even if the long stream of presidents from Reagan on were pro-GMO. And it's worked. 46% of Americans are seeking non-GMO food, and food companies are kicking them out. But at this time, because of the inexpensive nature and still highly risky nature of gene editing, we're in an entirely new world. You can go on Amazon and buy a do-it-yourself gene editing kit for $159 before Christmas and $161 after, so you missed out on saving $2 to create new organisms that have never been part of the history of evolution. And if you happen to flush them down the toilet, you've just done an environmental release. Now, when we show this three-minute film, some people are wondering, well, how bad can it be? What could possibly go wrong? So a large portion of this lecture is that, answering that question. And I'm going to give you some good news and some inspiration at the end, so don't leave in the middle. You'll feel very depressed. <laughs> so I want to start with fish. There are almost 40 fish in the pipeline, maybe many more by now. And already, there's genetically engineered salmon being sold and consumed in Canada, particularly in restaurants and by catering organizations. And when they did research on this fish, they found that the allergic responses, according to the reaction in the blood, was 20 to 52% higher, but they considered it not statistically significant because they only used six fish. In other words, they designed the study so that even a huge increase in allergenicity could be avoided, knowing that they were about to be feeding it to millions of people. This was in criminal in my mind. They also found that there was higher levels of IGF-1. In, in one case, 40% higher. That is a cancer promoter. And they used a, a method of detecting growth hormones that was so bad, they couldn't detect the hormones. And rather than improve their detection, they said, there's no problem. They didn't find a difference between the experiment and the control because they didn't find it anywhere. This is not science. This is corporate science. This is tobacco science. Now, what, are, what is the genetically engineered salmon? Well, it's designed to produce a growth hormone nonstop. And so it grows fast. A similar salmon was studied in Canada by scientists and they put these genetically engineered fast-growing salmon in tanks, either just with the GMOs 
or with the non-GMO salmon, and when they fed them enough food, it was fine. When they lowered the amount of food, the frankenfish freaked. Why? Because they're fast-growing and they're voracious. They're always hungry. So, they became cannibals and started killing and eating their competition, whether they were genetically engineered or not. And it, in each tank, there was either a population crash or a complete extinction. They also would travel to different parts of this fake underground ecosystem, hunting out other fish, whereas the natural salmon wouldn't go there. So they became highly aggressive, cannibalistic. And if you imagine what could happen uh, in the oceans, it's tragic. But here's another scenario of a Japanese type fish called a madaka. They genetically engineered it. And there's a mating advantage because it's a little larger, the females go after the larger males, and their offspring only have a 70% survival rate instead of 100%. So in Purdue University, they put 60 fish in a computer model of a population of 60,000, programmed the natural behaviors of the GMOs, and found that in 40 generations, there were no more fish. These for whatever reason, these particular characteristics, higher mating advantage, lower survival, resulted in extinction. Now, these are the, we know that in North Atlantic alone, more than two million salmon escape the fish farms. Now, the genetically engineered salmon are not supposed to be grown in fish farms. They're supposed to be grown in inland tanks. However, there's now interest from all over the world, and we know that the monitoring and guarding the movement of GMOs has been poorly, poorly supervised, and they've had things stolen out of uh, test plots and things diverted and sold accidentally. So imagine what would happen in the world, in the oceans, if we have these genetically engineered salmon. Either you have these adolescent gangs of ravenous fish attacking species, or wiping out the salmon uh, population, or we don't know. So this is an example of something that could be catastrophic to the ecosystem based on a single pair of fish released outdoors if it comes to it. In the 90s, there was a genetically engineered bacteria engineered to turn plant matter into alcohol. And some very well-meaning scientists had a great idea. Let's send this bacteria to farmers. When farmers finish their harvest, they often burn the crop rubble. And instead, they can mix it in huge barrels with the bacteria and turn it into alcohol. Turn a spigot on the... On the Barrel, get the alcohol, and run their tractor. Then all of the nutrient-rich sludge at the bottom of the barrel could be spread on the field as fertilizer. The EPA said, great, go ahead, do it. You've already done, you've tried to test it this way and this way and this way. We have no further tests. Go for it. A graduate student needed some research for his PhD. Talked to his advisor, Dr. Elaine Ingham. They approved research on this particular bacteria, Klebsiella planticola. And he did something that was not required. He tested that sludge as a fertilizer. So he put soil that was growing wheat seeds over here, soil that was growing wheat seeds with regular Klebsiella planticola, and then the GMO version. The, he mixed the sludge with the, with the soil and grew the wheat seeds over there. Two weeks before they were going to release this bacteria to see how far it spread on its own. That was their first experiment. Let's put it outdoors, release it, and monitor how far it goes. Two weeks before that, Saturday morning, shows up at his laboratory, gets into his workplace, and he's, oh my God. I must have done something wrong. All of the little sprouts of wheat on the GMO side 
or just this green slime. It was all turned to mush. He figured he did something wrong. But when he looked closer, he realized that the GMO bacteria had turned the plants to alcohol. Elaine Ingham, his supervisor, told me later on, someone from the EPA told her about a secret study that the EPA will not acknowledge. They released a different GMO bacteria to see how far it would spread. In the first season, 11 miles. And after they stopped funding it, one person continued to test it in wider and wider regions, sometimes on her own dime. And eventually they found it everywhere on Earth. So when you put that study from the EPA together with this, I asked Dr. Ingham, what would happen if they did release it, if it was deployed? She said, it could end terrestrial plant life. All the crops grown in soil have this bacteria. If you introduce a GMO bacteria that outpopulates and outsurvives its natural parent, then it could be replaced by bacteria that would convert all the plant roots to alcohol. So it could have been a cataclysm. So you had headlines like, a biological apocalypse averted. There's, gene editing is being talked about by the biotech industry in the same way that genetically engineered soybeans and corn were talked about 25 years ago. Safe and predictable. Don't need regulation. Well, so many studies have proven that false. But what didn't stop Australia from saying, you can gene edit animals, plants, bacteria, microorganisms of any type, and release them into the environment, or sell them to people to eat, and you don't have to tell the government. They just call it breeding, which you can do on your own, and you can do whatever you want. So there was a study that was published about cows that were gene edited to knock out the gene that created horns. So they created hornless cattle. So they could stuff a lot of cows in together in factory farms. And when they published the research, a letter from a very pro-GMO mouthpiece <laughs> um, wrote, a letter wrote saying, this proves we don't need any regulation on gene-edited animals because it's perfect, no side effects. This proves that it's precise and predictable. And sure enough, they started to grow these hornless cattle in Brazil. They were filling out a herd for release. Well, in the fall of this year, in September, the FDA decided to actually do a sequence of part of this cow's genome. And they found that there were pieces of the bacteria that was used in the genetic engineering process that were stuffed into the gene edit. And now every cell of these cow's bodies had antibiotic resistant genes that could resist three different types of antibiotics. Now, if the gene from these cells were to transfer to pathogenic bacteria, either in the cow's gut or from the cow manure or from the decomposing cow or from eating the cow in our bodies, it could promote diseases that would not be treatable with antibiotics. There's someone speaking at this conference or in the conference program, it says there could be as much as 700,000 deaths per year due to antibiotic resistance. I don't know if it's that high, but it's certainly in the tens of thousands in the United States, and there's also a lot of amputations to cut off the part of the body that has the untreatable infection. 
When this was made public, they killed all of the genetically engineered cows in Brazil that they were growing out to create herds, and we averted a near catastrophe. This was their poster child. Now, how did it happen? When you do gene editing, you create enzymes, let's call them scissors, and they cut the double-stranded DNA, but not at random. They have another guide that's attached to them, and the guide looks for a certain sequence. When they hit the sequence that they want, it cuts it there. Now, there's some problems. Sometimes that sequence appears over and over and over in the genome. So it'll cut there and there and there. Those are called off-target cuts. Sometimes it'll cut things in similar sequences. And for some reason, sometimes there's a thousand point mutations at the end of this exercise, or it's insertions or deletions. Now, the people using gene editing tend to use an algorithm, a computer program, to let them know whether it's safe. They predict the most likely other cuts. And then in our infinite wisdom we say, would cutting the genome over there cause any problems based on what we currently know about the way the DNA functions? So with that little bit of knowledge of what we currently know about how DNA functions, which the scientists say, well, this is all we need, they say, yeah, we can afford to do gene editing for a crop and introduce it into the food supply, even though we know there'll be some off-target cuts. Now, there are already gene-edited products being sold. There's this oil that's being sold to restaurants, Cebus, and it's canola oil where they used genetic engineering to change it and they're labeling it as non-GMO. Because they're claiming that GMOs are only when you transfer genes between species. But they only edited the gene within the species. So it's not what we consider, their definition is not what we consider correct. It's not what the European Union considers correct. It doesn't, it's not what the official documents in the United States correct. But they're going to say, we're just going to call it non-GMO. So it's already on the market. Gene drives. How many people have heard of gene drives? Raise your hand. Gene drives. Only just about three of you. Normally, when, you, when a mother and father produce offspring, the genes get div divvied up so that half of your offspring get one trait and the other half get another trait and then when the offspring marry and reproduce and produce kids, then the game, there's another dilution. It happens quicker with fruit flies. With gene drives, you genetically engineer so that your gene ends up on both sides of your chromosomes. It ends up so that when you give birth, all of the offspring have the trait, but you also <clears throat> they also have the genetic engineering mechanism in their genes, which does the same kind of genetic engineering in them so that when they give birth, then all of their offspring have the trait, and then all of their offspring have the trait. So instead of breaking it up like it is on the, on the slide here, you can see that all of the offspring at the bottom have the, the inheritance of what you've created. I was at a conference in the uh, UN Conference on Biodiversity, the Convention on Biological Diversity, and there was a group that was trying to push gene drives to wipe out rats from certain islands because they, had, they were invasive species. So let's create the gene drives and kill all of the rats. Maybe they'll produce just sterile males or maybe just males. Now, how did the rats get there? In the hulls of ships. If those rats that were getting the gene drive were ending up in hulls of ships, then it could end up on other places and other islands and other continents, and we could wipe out a species. What happens to the ecosystem? Or what happens to the ecosystem if the gene drive mechanism transfers to another rodent? 
or to another mammal or to a different species altogether, a different kingdom? Or what happens if your genetic engineering changes and it doesn't do what you're, it's supposed to do, like the mosquitoes didn't kill it all, but makes the animals somehow more aggressive or more dangerous? We're playing with nature in a way that is intentionally vast in time and space and in a way that has a level of arrogance that surpasses what we could have even thought of before. This is a picture of a farm that has all the different plans that are currently being considered for gene drives, from mosquitoes to corn to trees, all these different things. Are, there's groups that are considering how we can permanently alter nature and all the future species to better fit within our industrial agricultural model. This is the thinking. There's even people that have trying to have considered genetically engineering out the mothering instinct from cows and livestock so that when you separate their children, they don't get upset. So instead of structuring agriculture or to fit nature, they're trying to redesign nature to fit industrial agriculture. Now here's another fun one. Double-stranded RNA already being deployed in apples and potatoes near you. These apples and potatoes form a very important task. They don't turn brown when you slice them. So they lie about their age, like the Botox apple. You can cut it, it can shrivel, but it'll never turn brown. Now, what they do is they put in a gene that produces a little piece of RNA that folds back on itself and becomes double-stranded. It's very short, maybe 22 nucleotides. And its code will then, as if, hunt for a matching code in the DNA of the apple. And when it finds it, it silences the expression of that particular gene. So it's gene silencing technology. It's one of the things that RNA does. Surprise, no one knew 30 years ago. Now, could that be impactful on humans? Well, we know that when they fed honeybees one meal of double-stranded RNA, they chose the double-stranded RNA from something that was completely foreign to the honeybee so they wanted it to use it as a control. They were looking for something that had no impact whatsoever. And they checked the gene expression twice, a few weeks later and a few weeks later. And they found that over 1,400 genes had changed their levels of expression. About 10% of the genome of the honeybee was altered in its functioning because of a single meal of double-stranded RNA. They know that it, humans can eat double-stranded RNA and it can affect and change our gene expression. RNA is one of the ways that we get intelligence from our food. It's not just minerals and proteins and phytochemicals. The RNA can help tell our DNA how to express. They've changed uh, gene expression in mice through double-stranded RNA. So if you eat the apple or the potato, what will happen when that double-stranded RNA finds a match in your genome? It might reprogram it. And this was the warning of a USDA scientist who published an article, much to the chagrin of his, of his superiors, and he's no longer at the USDA. I interviewed him, and his point was, we have no way to evaluate the risks because all these different organisms out in the nature, including humans, could eat the apple. He wasn't talking specifically about the apple, but eat anything that's using the double-stranded RNA and it can change their gene expression. The EPA scientist came up with a similar article, not on GMO organisms, that use RNA, but on sprays. Monsanto got approved a spray 
that kills bugs by changing their gene expression. And imagine if the wind blows and it lands on you. What happens with this mysterious rash? Who knew? And they have used an interesting double standard saying, oh, it couldn't possibly affect us. It doesn't affect through different species. And yet somehow we use it as an insecticide so it actually kills different species. So it works where we want it to and it doesn't work where we don't want it to. That's their, their theory. Oops. Now, changes in RNA turn out to be inheritable as well. Epigenetics. It's not just the genes that are passed down, but also the mechanism that tells which genes to express. And this has unfortunately been discovered by a scientist that injected Roundup into mice. And 90% of the great-grandchildren had serious diseases. And they were more serious than the grandchildren. The children were fine, and the injected pregnant mouse was fine, and mice. But the great-grandchildren had it worse. 90% had prostate, kidney, prostate and kidney disease, obesity, and deaths during pregnancy. If you want to know more details, please like our Facebook, Institute for Responsible Technology, and go da back to an interview I did with Dr. Skinner. I speak with him for 45 minutes. He is the scientist that did this research. And it's astounding. He thinks we're already suffering from the DDT exposure of our parents. And the obesity, he thinks, is in part due to the results of this epigenetic effect of previous chemicals. Now, instead of looking at GMOs, we're looking at GMEs genetically modified ecosystems, where you can genetically engineer the bacteria in your soil, the insects that will pollinate, the sprays that will create changes in the plants. You may even use non-GMO plants and call them non-GMO, but everything else in the environment around it has been genetically engineered. Now, what's interesting is, and there's so many different ways to genetic engineer, this is a list I'm not even gonna start but the one common result, the most common result of genetic engineering is surprise side effects. And there's a statement made by a scientist in England that I like to quote, or at least paraphrase, and that a risk, no matter how small, if repeated, uh, is, is repeated enough, becomes a certainty. When you have problems that are one in a thousand, one in 10,000, one in a million. What happens if we introduce a million genetically engineered organisms in this generation? What we could alter the weather, we could create, we can damage terrestrial plants, create sterility, wipe out species. And, the, and we know the impacts of a single, a single natural invasive species that worked in harmony with its own ecosystem, transplanted to New York City or Long Island or, or Washington or wherever, it can create chaos in the ecosystem. And they're talking about replacing the ecosystem with a technology whose number one most common result is surprise side effects. What could go wrong? Everything. Now, we have arrived at an inevitable time in human civilization. This is part of the deal. This is part of science. We've got to the place where we can reorder the codes of life cheaply and easily. We can redirect the streams of evolution. And we have not gotten to the point where we understand the impacts, where we have long-term thinking in our individuals and our government and our corporations. And we don't have that supremely high ethics and morality to carry that responsibility. So we now have a new responsibility that comes with this new capacity. And this is what my organization, the Institute for Responsible Technology, is now focusing on. I'm not giving up 
on talking about the health dangers and changing people's lives. I'm going to give you a shortcut in five minutes. Maybe some of you will change, their, change your number in orga to organic. Let's just play with that. And then we'll come back to the bigger picture. Changes in Roundup Ready corn, for example. Higher levels of putrescine and cadaverine, this, the, the, responsible for the foul odor of rotting dead bodies. They're also linked to cancer and allergies. We have the stomach lining of rats and that have changed as a result of the process of genetic engineering, irrespective of what gene you put in. People who switched to non-GMO and largely organic diet reported getting better from 28 different conditions. 85% were said digestive problems. Let me just read a few. Fatigue, obesity, brain fog, depression, anxiety, allergies and sensitivities, memory and concentration. Did I say memory and concentration? Joint pain, seasonal allergies, gluten sensitivity, insomnia, skin conditions, hormonal problems, musculoskeletal pain, autoimmune disease, eczema, high blood pressure, asthma, menstrual problems, diabetes, etc., cancer, autism, people reporting getting better from those things. And we also have a situation where animals, pets and livestock taken off of GMOs get better from some of those things as well. And lab animals force-fed GMOs in Roundup suffer from those things or their precursors. And the rates of disease for those and similar things are rising in the US population in parallel with GMOs. Let's look at just the just the slope of the line, which is, in this case, the amount of Roundup sprayed on Roundup-ready soy and corn in the United States compared to inflammatory bowel disease. Notice the similarity. This is correlation. It doesn't prove causation. But when you have all these other things, including we understand how Roundup and GMOs could create every one of the diseases I'm about to show, so we have the plausible causative pathways that could explain why consumption of more GMOs than your body weight per year, and all the Roundup, not only in GMOs, but in the grains and beans that are sprayed with Roundup before harvest, why it could be creating and promoting these diseases, we know how. So let's just look at these diseases and see if you happen to fit in the category or someone you know, inflammatory bowel disease and deaths from intestinal infection, peritonitis, uh, death from kidney failure, acute kidney injury, hepatitis C, autism at six years old, nearly a perfect correlation, diabetes, deaths from stroke, Deaths from uh, uh, dementia. Deaths from senile dementia. Alzheimer deaths. Parkinson deaths. Deaths from obesity. Deaths from hypertension. Anemia. Insomnia. Other sleep disorders. Celiac. Birth defects, lipoprotein metabolism deaths, anxiety, suicide by overdose, schizophrenia, ADHD, breast cancer. New research shows that glyphosate did promote breast cancer when it was present with another compound that's present in all humans causing multiplication of breast cancer tumors in mice. The, I, the International Agency for Research on Cancer said glyphosate's a probable human carcinogen, which might explain the correlation with liver and bile duct cancer, kidney and pelvic cancer, urinary bladder cancer, thyroid cancer, acute myeloid leukemia deaths, and glyphosate and Roundup are sprayed on the non-GMO grains and beans and also lots of fruits and vegetables. So that's why we say organic. Organic to avoid GMOs and Roundup. Non-GMO could still be sprayed with Roundup. If you want to know what can happen if you switch to organic, I did a film with Amy Hart. It took us four years. It converts virtually everyone who sees it to raise their number to a higher percentage of what they're committing to in their life in terms of organic. Because two autistic kids in the film, their family switches to organic, they're no longer on the spectrum. 
92 couples who were infertile. They switched to an organic diet and, a, and as part of a chiropractic care, all of them have children. People who had cancer, skin problems, brain fog, overweight, they switch, they get better, the doctors verify, the science explains why. Secretingredientsmovie.com. Please take a picture of this slide. Please go there and show it to the people you've been trying to convince to change their diet and watch it yourself so that you can increase your number. For those here today, I have copies of this and my earlier film, Genetic Roulette, outside. They'll be on sale right after. An interesting motivation for people is that many types of animals, when given a choice, will eat the, the non-GMO, but not the GMO. Mice, rats, cows, deer, elk, raccoons, birds, dogs, chickens. We have to get humans up to the level of animals. 